everything that's being done uh, would not have been possible without your voluntary service and we pray that God will bless you and continue to use you for his glory. Mark 11, 15. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer of house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a robber's den. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the privilege that you have granted us this morning to come to your throne of grace and look unto you for grace, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your majestic presence among your people this morning. Pray that you will talk to us, Lord. Deal with our hearts this morning. Minister to our lives this morning. We pray that our lives will be transformed by your voice this morning. We, we pray that you will anoint the servant's lips and your, my tongue. That your oracles will be heard as it is, Lord. Let no man take glory. We pray that you alone will be lifted up, Lord. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to be doing. We bless your people in the name, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. This is one of the harshest indictments ever uttered by anyone about a place of worship. And it's all the more significant when you realize that they came out from the mouth of our Lord Jesus himself. We know the scenario very well. Jesus rode on, rode on the colt into the temple as the crowd was cheering Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And he entered the temple courts and saw what was going on there. And he shouted these words to the ones that were gathered there. What followed is even worse. He braided his own whip and chased the money changers and the vendors of religious wares from there. These are harsh words, very hard words, and his actions were even harder. Jesus is in fact quoting from two Old Testament prophets. Isaiah 56, 7, it goes like this. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And in Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11, the prophet Jeremiah laments like this. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known. And then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name. And say, we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers for you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Jesus actually made one sentence out of combining these two statements from the prophets. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus did an earlier cleansing of the temple, and we read about it in the Gospel of June, uh, John chapter 2. And this is actually towards the end of his ministry. King Solomon in all his splendor and majesty built the temple in Jerusalem. This place of worship was unlike anything in the then world. One of the most majestic architectural creations in that world. When Solomon dedicated this temple, he prayed one of the most moving prayers 
in the Bible and it's written in 1 Kings chapter 8. He started praying like this. Will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built? Meaning that God to whom this built, temple is built cannot live in this temple. He cannot be contained even in the vastness of this majestic universe. Then how little can he be expected to live in the four walls of a temple? The same is echoed by Stephen in Acts 7 when he is before, right before his stoning, being stoned to death, he's saying that the Most High does not live in houses made by men. God is a spirit, and he cannot be contained in a physical structure made by the hands of man. Apostle Paul, when he is talking to the Athenian philosophers, he's saying that God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples made by hands. Acts 17, 24. Then why in the world did Jesus get offended by anything that was going on in this temple? What was so offensive to Jesus? about these religious vendors and money changers. After all, they were making the temple relevant by what they were doing. The outer court of the temple is, the, is for the Gentiles. It's the Gentiles' court. Thousands of people from all over the world come there during the times of the Jewish feast. And they needed the temple coins to purchase animals for sacrifice. It is impractical for all these people who live outside of Jerusalem to bring their own animals because people were traveling from all over. And they were mostly coming either on animals or many of them even walking. And there were hundreds of merchants selling animals of all kinds for the sacrifice. Doves, sheep, bulls, goats, etc. So people could offer sacrifice, a matter of simple convenience. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, during one Passover week alone, these merchants sold 255,000 lambs. And that's more than a quarter million lambs in one week. The court of the Gentiles where these non-Jewish people gathered and worshipped was where these vendors established their place. Some are of opinion that Jesus turned over the tables of the vendors and he was against, because he was against any business that was going on in the temple. I believe it's a very simplistic way of interpretation. He did not do it out of a tantrum like a child. We need to do some ordinary business in the temple. Let me tell you, in today's language, it is almost like having some fundraising things in our church. Managing the affairs of the church. Running a bake sale for that matter. Or anything similar to that. Is it against God's will to have some necessary business in the church? Like having our board meetings, for example? Having building committee? Mission board? Bylaw committee? Or any activity outside of the real worship? Is it all bad? I personally sit in some of them, so I know it is not all that bad. In fact, in the book of Acts, we know that even in the early church, there were business activities that needed to be taken care of 
And there were provisions for that in Acts chapter 6. But when we read there, we know that even there, those activities were entrusted with spiritually oriented people. They were not just randomly chosen. They were chosen because they were proven trustworthy. Some others have suggested that Jesus was angry since the vendors were charging rates that were above the market price and making incredible profits at the expense of these vulnerable people. Personally, I'm totally convicted that wherever people, wherever possible, the people of God should give liberally to the church and the causes of the church rather than taking away from it and making profit out of church-based business deals. Nevertheless, it is quite unlikely that the Lord was indignant about the way they were conducting business there, nor that there was necessary business in the temple. For us to get some understanding, we must go back to 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 through 53. When I, I'll be referring to many verses, and I won't be reading many of them. Those who are here, please feel free to write them down. Those who are listening to me online, please note them down and read it and verify that I am right. In 1 Kings chapter 8, King Solomon is dedicating this beautiful, majestic temple in one of the most passionate prayers ever prayed by anybody in the Old Testament. King Solomon is dedicating this house, this temple as a house of prayer. Please read that chapter when you get a chance. In his prayer, we hear him repeating words like this. Your people, your servant, prayers, confessions, forgive Lord, answer their prayers. The temple was to be a house of prayer where people of God would offer prayer, confess their sins, ask for forgiveness, return to God, and God would forgive their sins even from remote places. It was not because necessary business was being conducted in the temple that the Lord was angry, but because the activities that were happening were only those business. The activities of the temple had been degraded just to business activities and rituals of sacrifices without any meaningful relationship with God. No true worship was happening at the temple at that time. Religion had become a ritual and a business for them. There was no prayer happening there. It was not a personal vendetta of an emotionally disturbed person that you see there. But the demonstration of a holy judgment of the holy God of a holy place meant for his people to worship that was defiled by the infiltration of world and ungodly things. What was meant to be a house of prayer had become anything but that. It had been brought down to a place of mere commercial transactions, a business deal rather than a place of prayer, a place of relationship, and a place of trust and love. I sacrifice this, and you do this for me. That is not Christian faith. That is paganism. That is not Israeli God, the God of Israel. That is paganism. This is what the prophets of all times vigorously denounced. The substitution of a religion of mere externals in place of a religion of the heart. As early as the times of King Saul, 2,000 years before Jesus, the Lord declared, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices 
as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 22. What God wants from you and me is not your sacrifice. He wants you. Before it's anything about giving to God from your hands or getting anything, anything from his hands, it's about seeking his face with your face. In the beginning of the scriptures, Genesis chapter 4, we know two people that went to worship. Cain and Abel, Genesis 4.4. 4. It's written there. The Lord was pleased with Abel and then his sacrifice. And in verse 5 it's written, on Cain and his sacrifice, he was not pleased. God who looks at your heart decides whether your sacrifice is acceptable. When you see religion as a transaction, it's diagonally in contrast to religion as prayer. Religion as prayer is diabolically opposite to religion as a transaction. That's why Jesus said, my temple should be a house of prayer. We learned earlier that the Most High does not live in buildings made by human hands. Then what is this temple that the Lord desires to live in? Now I want you to pay close attention to me. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 2 Corinthians 6.16 it goes like this. You do you not know that you yourself are the temple of the living God and the spirit of God dwells in you. Don't you know that? People of God, don't you know that you are the temple of the living God and God lives in you? That means we have God living in us. The third person in Trinity is living in us. We are his living temple. And we carry God inside of us. We are the carriers of the presence of God. Have you ever thought of that? You and I carry the holy God inside of us. That is a very profound truth. You know, the 12 disciples walked with Jesus for three and a half years. They saw Jesus preach. They saw Jesus teach and heal and doing all kinds of miracles. They even saw him raising dead. But not a single time did they come and ask Jesus, Lord, teach us how to do these things. Not a single time. But do you know what they did want? One day they came to the Lord and said, Lord, teach us to pray. They realized that there was something special about praying. Jesus himself demonstrated that fact in his life and they saw Jesus praying. The apostolic church knew this. And in Acts it is mentioned that one of the main reasons that they gathered was to pray. There is a new and an evil thinking that prayer is just a tradition and you don't need much of that. You don't need to start a worship meeting with prayer. You don't need to pray in between. You don't need to pray at the end. Hallelujah. For these people, Prayer is unnecessary except when they are sick, when they are smitten with an incurable disease, or when they are supported by a ventilator in the ICU. That's the only time they need to pray. Lord, forgive them. 
If the Lord came to them today, he'll be braiding his own whip again. We are the temple of the living God. You and I are the temple of the living God. I am the temple of the living God. God is grieved when this temple is downgraded to just daily business deals. We do need business deals. You and I need to make business deals every day. But when you and I have been degenerated down just to business deals every day, the Lord is grieved. We are called to be people who pray. Money, to make money is not bad. You need money. But everything about you is money making. You are running away from what God has intended you to be. Do you not know that you are called to be the temple of the living God? Number two, do you not know that your family is the temple of the living God? And the Lord wants to live in your family. The husband, the wife, and the children come together and offer prayer. We see the presence of the Lord in the Garden of Eden. With the first family, Adam and Eve, and the Lord with them. Hallelujah. Glory. In this temple, the husband takes the role of the prophet and the priest. He has been designated that function to teach, to be in charge, to be minister in that temple. Hallelujah. Abraham knew this secret. And we know everywhere Abraham went, he built an altar. He built an altar. I don't have time to dwell on any of these things. Thirdly, do you not know the church of Jesus is the temple of the living God? Every one of us carry the presence of God and when two or three of us gather in one accord in his name, he is in their midst. Today, he is in our midst. Whether you are listening here or through virtual media, the Lord is in our midst. Hallelujah. Prayer is what we offer in this church, in this house. It's not about this, the four walls of this building. We don't lock God in this building after the service and come back and see him next week. God doesn't live here. We are the people who carry the presence of God. We carry him around because he dwells in our hearts. We are the temple of the living God. We are the house of prayer. We offer prayer in this house. When you hear the word prayer, what do you think of prayer? To many people, prayer is just petitioning. Asking for God's help. But prayer is far more than that. Hallelujah. First of all, why is the temple a house of prayer? Because prayer is play, pray, paying close attention to God. Prayer is not just petitioning. Yes, there is petitioning in prayer. But prayer is when you pay close attention to God. Prayer is admitting that you take God seriously. It is not just unloading your petitions before God. Sure, there is a place for petitions. Some have said prayer has four components. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. 
in the acronym for that being ACTS, A-C-T-S. A for adoration, C for confession, T for thanksgiving, and S for supplication. That is very true. And if we can do that, it'll, it's better than just a petition prayer alone. I, I'm not going to dwell there. Yes, these are integral parts of prayer. You must adore God for who he is. You must confess your sins. You must be thankful to God in prayer. And you must then submit before him your supplication. Moses was a man of prayer. He loved to pray. He spent 40 days and 40 night, nights in the presence of God. And at the end of that period, he did not even realize that he had been transformed. He was so closely paying attention to God that he didn't even realize that his passions were changing. His priorities were changing. The rules he lived by were changing. Even his looks have changed. We read that Moses' face was shining as he was coming down from the mountain the stone tablets. When we are in the proximity of the eternal living God, the eternal holy God, we will see ourselves in his holy light. We become aware of our un unworthiness, our filthiness. Up there, no one of us can brag or boast about anything. We cannot pull a cover over our sins and walk around as if nothing has happened. Our God is a consuming fire. Confession must be an integral part of prayer. Confess to God that you sinned. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sins. 1 John 1, 7. Hallelujah. We must have a repentance in prayer. We must have returned to God in prayer. Prayer also requires reconciliation. Hallelujah. It will lead to reconciliation. Repentance, return to God, and reconciliation. And Moses was changed so much in 40 days that he had absolutely no tolerance for sin when he came down the mountain. He was carrying the presence of God to the camp. But that camp was anything but ready to receive the holy presence of God. What we see next in the Israeli camp is something similar to what we see in the temple of uh, Jerusalem when Jesus went there. The meekest, the meekest person on earth became the most violent man in the camp because the divine presence makes no compromise with sin. He saw that the Israelites were reveling in idolatry and frolicking in sin, in wild sin. The man who paid close attention to God for the past several days was immediately filled with holy indignation towards his own people. When we spend time with God, we will see sin as sin is and will not want to compromise with. When Aaron compromised and made people to sin, and when the Israeli leaders compromised and kept quiet, the man of prayer refused to do that. He made a, we may compromise with sin because we don't pray. Prayerlessness makes us compromise and make deals with sin. Prayer makes you absorb attributes of God into your life. Prayer is paying close attention to God. Number two, my temple is a house of prayer where I intercede by standing in the gap. Prayer makes you an intercessor. God is looking for intercessors. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30 says about the Lord. I looked for a man who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on the 
on behalf of the land so i would not have to destroy it but i found none god is looking for people who intercede on behalf of the land the people of god are called to be intercessors when the land is filled with sin and idolatry when the land is destroyed by plague like it is happening now when the land is marked for god's judgment as it is happening now the man of prayer intercedes abraham knew the secret of intercession in genesis chapter 18 verse 22 we read like this the men turned away and went towards sodom but abraham remained standing before the lord hallelujah and in one translation it says like abraham jumped before the lord and stopped his progression towards it. he jumped right before that the lord would not go and started negotiating with god and that is intercession abraham was a man of prayer he knew the value of intercession in one of the most daring intercessory prayers abraham is negotiating with god on behalf of sodom and gomorrah and the neighboring cities he literally interrupts god's journey towards that city people of god we are called to be intercessors the land is ripe for destruction there is all kinds of sin in the land in fact it is not that sin is present but sin is promoted sin is licensed sin is legalized and sin is even rewarded in our nation the great evangelist billy graham in an article my heart aches for america says that one day his wife ruth came to him and she was weeping because of the moral decline and the sexual anarchy in america and then she said if god doesn't punish america he will have to apologize to sodom and gomorrah when was the last time you prayed for your nation for our motherland india for the city that you live in for your family as an intercessor and for the unregenerate people around you we are called to be people of intercession daniel was a man of prayer daniel 9 an interceding man a confessing man though absolutely no sin could be recorded about daniel in the pages of scriptures he identifies with his sinful people and prays in chapter 9 verse 5 oh lord we have sinned and gone wrong we have been wicked and have rebelled we have turned away from your commands now in verse 17 he says now our god hear the prayers and petitions of your servant for your sake O oh lord look with favor on your sanctuary give ear O oh god and hear open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name we do not make requests of you because you are we are righteous but because of your great mercy O oh lord listen O oh god forgive O oh lord hear and act O oh lord oh my god do not delay Ezekiel was a man of intercession. In one of the most painful intercessions, we see him lying on his left side for 390 days, interceding for the nation of Israel, and lying on the other side for another 40 days for interceding for the nation of Judah. Ezekiel 4.4. Prayer involves pain. Intercession involves agony. It is traveling, it's denying yourself and denying all your comforts. Nehemiah was an intercessor, intercessor, praying and weeping when he heard about the plight of the people in Jerusalem. Nehemiah 1, 4, 1, 4 through 11. He prays, O oh Lord, God of heaven, I confess the sins. We Israelites, including myself and my father's house committed against you god is looking for people 
who will stand in the gap and pray and weep. He says, my temple shall be house of prayer. You and I are called to be that house of prayer, that house of intercession. And my final and third point, my temple is a house of prayer where I rebuild my altar. Like prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see Elijah single-handedly combating 450 prophets, false prophets of Baal. It's a showdown between Baal's prophets and Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. We all know the story. Baal's prophets prayed intensely till evening, even hurting themselves. But nothing happened. But in verse 36, Elijah prays one of the most powerful, but one of the sh shortest prayers written in the pages of scriptures. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and I have done all these at your command. O Lord, answer so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God. Then the fire of the Lord came and burned the sacrifice, the wood, the stone, and the soil, and licked up the water in the trench. What a dramatic display of the power and the presence of God. But before this, something happened. Elijah looked around and saw that the stones that made up the altar were scattered all over. He knew that God will not accept an offering made on scattered stones. He picked them up, one after another, stacked them up and put them together and rebuilt the altar. The stones became united one to the other. Then he slaughtered the animal, skinned it, cut it into pieces and stacked on the altar. And then he prayed and the fire of God came. The Lord is pleased with our prayer when we come in one accord, in unity, in full surrender and with one purpose to experience his presence. Hallelujah. One reason that the Lord is not answering our prayers is our lack of unity. Our disunity. Yes, we are from many nations, true. But we must be one in the Lord. The blood of the Lamb has united us into one body. We must be united in heart when we come to worship and when we come to pray. We have the Holy Spirit in us that unites us. The spirit of unity. Apostle Paul was a man of prayer. Many of his prayers are recorded in the scriptures. In his prayer for Ephesian believers recorded in, in Ephesians 1 and 3, he prays for their establishing in faith, their filling and being led by the Holy Spirit and their unity and that Christ might dwell in them. That they might be rooted deep and grow in stature to the fullness that God had intended for them. We are called to be praying for the body of Christ that it may grow in structure, stature. The challenges are many. The church today is targeted on every side. I am sure all of you read last week's circular about from Pastor Shibu Thomas about the persecution that is unraveled in church, in, against the church. Hallelujah. We need to be praying for the persecuted church. In the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm going to close here. The Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was in agony as he was praying to his father. Blood, brothers, please keep it quiet for a minute. Blood was stripping from his body as if sweat. Blood was dripping from his body. He had asked his beloved disciples to hold him in prayers. But they failed miserably. To support him as he was agonizing in deep pain. It says Jesus was in anguish. Today also the body of Christ is bleeding. The church is persecuted physically, intellectually, politically, and from all angles. 
His disciples are called to pray. We who are called to pray shall not sleep at this time. Let us be vigilant. Let's be alert. Let us be prayerful, brothers and sisters. Let us close the doors of our prayer chamber and go on our knees and pray. We are the temple of the living God. And this temple shall be called a house of prayer. Wake up. Dedicate specified time of our life to pray. Allocate time to pray. For personal pray in your personal time. Pray in your personal time. Is your temple a house of prayer? Gather your family to pray. Pray confessing. Pray repenting. Pray in humility. Hallelujah. Let your life be transformed as you take God seriously in prayer. You are called to be a house of prayer. May the good Lord allow all of us to be transformed into his likeness as we sit in his presence and pray. May the Lord bless you.